and talk to you a little bit about uh, how we can parallelize a common statistical tool that's quite uh, popular. Uh, it's an open source package called R. It's a derivative of the S language developed by John Chambers at Bell Labs. It's a functional language. Uh, the developers, the original developers of R, uh, Rossi Hawk and Robert Gentleman, drew from Scheme and Lisp for a lot of their inspiration in creating R. It's a functional language for performing basic statistical uh, analyses and calculations. Uh, it can do things like mean, standard deviation, variances, and it can also do very complex analyses such as linear models, linear mixed models, machine learning, uh, neural nets, and other types of operations. Most of the complex functionality is actually provided through these things called add-on packages that users develop. So there's a very small core net of individuals that actually work on R itself. There's roughly 20 or so of these distributed around the world. And then there are several thousand users who actually develop additional more complex functionalities on top of the R language. Okay. Uh, one of the, the things about R that really hurts its performance is the fact that it operates in serial. It, it doesn't really take advantage of multiple threads or multiple uh, computers if you have, advantage, uh, have access to that. So Revolution Computing, the place where I work, we actually create a, uh, a product called Parallel R, and it allows you to run R on, in parallel on a multi-core system or a cluster or anything else, or, or a grid-type system. We're a commercial open source company, meaning that uh, we use the open source version of R and try and sell support and services on top of that, as well as this parallel computing environment called Network Spaces. Now, we're not the only game in town. There are some other uh, tools that you can use. There's RMPI. This is a package that's built on top of MPI. It works with your favorite flavor of MPI, OpenMPI, LAM, or MPitch. Provides most of the functionality in each of these distributions at the same level of service, meaning that, as we saw in Brad's talk earlier this morning, you want to use MPI, you end up with code that started out with what was about six or seven lines of code and turned it up turned into about uh, 30 or 40 lines of code. Uh, same thing in R. If you want to run uh, your code in parallel using MPI, RMPI, it's going to be much longer, much uh, uh, more difficult to parse and maintain. Um, but at the same time, you're going to have a lot of very coarse control over uh, your, your parallel application. And it does require a working MPI installation. There's another package called R, uh, PVM. It does pretty much the same thing as RMPI, except it uses PVM as the, the communications mechanism. The problem with those is that you really do have to know a lot about parallel computing. We want most of the people using R are not necessarily computer scientists. Uh, these are statisticians. And most of these people just want to run their analysis faster. They don't really want to become hardcore programmers. There is a subset of them that do. Uh, but for the most part, these are people that just want to be able to, if they have a quad-core machine at their desktop, they want to be able to run their analysis on all four cores and have uh, the benefit, the time benefit of that. So we created a, a tool, and we were thinking about what we wanted to, uh, in a, a tool. Uh, we wanted a, a pipeline assembly, something that uh, you could actually kind of build up the architecture and then deploy it, something that was very simple to use. Uh, Self-interaction over time, we didn't necessarily want the user to have to worry about all the communication processes. We wanted it to take care of it itself. Um, we wanted to be able to inspect the state of the system at various times. I mean, these are statisticians that are writing code that may or may not work, and they want to inspect what is the state of uh, various variables within their analysis over time. Uh, and it had to run on mixed environments because sometimes people have access to a whole grid. Uh, it could be a heterogeneous type system. We wanted to be able to allow people to use that. Um, some people also wanted to be able to call tools and other programs. So we wanted to be able to allow them that access as well. So we created something called Network Spaces. It's written in Python. It uses Twisted and Zope for its communication. Uh, it's based on the tuple spaces concept of Linda. So if you've used Linda Spaces or Gini or Java Spaces, it's going to use that very same concept of communications. Uh, provides its own coordination semantics for self-synchronization, so it handles all that itself. Uh, we can actually inspect the state of variables using the Babelfish tools that come in Zope. Uh, and it works on essentially any system that you can install Python and Twisted on. So if you can install those two systems, you can run Parallel R. Okay. 
So to start out, um, the concept of a workspace, this is something that's, that's very intuitive to most people. It's a namespace or binding set. Uh, it's a process to coordinate the data and how you actually access it. A network space is just that same concept, except we've distributed it out over a network. Um, but it requires this communication coordination system. Okay? And with these systems, the way we've designed this, it doesn't necessarily have to be heterogeneous, and the, the uh, data could be remote or it could be local on the system using a multi-core system. So let's take an example. So if we think about just a simple workspace, uh, let's, let's define variable A and let's assign values 1, 2, and 3 to it. This is going to create A in the workspace with 1, 2, and 3. We can retrieve A and so the syntax that I've used down here is just a common R syntax. So I just said A and it returns the values 1, 2, and 3. Okay. Requires that the data is local and we can only do this serially. So if I wanted to do something like A and then define B, it's going to do A and then B uh, sequentially. Okay. Now if we expand this to a workspace, so we had a whole network of computers and we want to share this, this data over workspace, we can just define a workspace WS and then store A on that workspace. Okay. So now we have A, it's associated with values 1, 2, and 3, but now it lives somewhere out on the net. And if we want to retrieve it, we can just say ws.find, so where ws is that workspace, find a, and it's going to return the value 1, 2, and 3. So if we were to type out a local, we would get 1, 2, and 3. Okay. And this allows us to be able to encapsulate um, uh, our implementation. And again, we chose to do this via Twisted and Zope in Python. Um, you can use any internet-based server to be able to use this. Uh, it's client agnostic, so the beauty of this is we don't necessarily have to limit ourselves to just R. We can write parallel applications in Python using network spaces. We can write uh, parallel applications in MATLAB. We have clients for both of those or any other language that can communicate over the net. Okay. Now, if I had remembered to bring my, my dongle, you would have actually seen a really neat little video here. Essentially, all this says is that if we had a uh, client up here that wanted to store the values, one, uh, value 1, 2, and 3 associated with A, it would go into this workspace, and then any other client that can connect to the workspace could then retrieve those values by just doing a find. What we would have seen here is, is that if all three of these clients had wanted to request a find of A on this, on the, from the workspace, but the value A had not yet been defined, they would just wait and then once we had defined A using the store mechanism, they would have then retrieved those values. Okay. And then here we could have actually stored a whole series of values. Say we started with uh, value 1, 2, and 3 and assigned it to A, and then we wanted to assign, assign the value 4, 5, and 6 to A, and then 7, 8, 9 to A. We could then fetch them in sequentially, and then they would depopulate uh, A. So we can actually ha have some kind of blocking mechanism in here as well. Um, so shared access via communication, we actually have some blocking, allowing you to have synchronization of states. Um, and it's all working within this familiar concept of a workspace, which allows a statistician to write their code in a way that they actually can understand. They don't have to get down to the low levels of uh, writing a communication mechanism. And coordinating the data is independent of the code that they write. It's all done by this network spaces uh, server. We have two different types within network spaces. We have a server type, which is where the data lives, and it actually handles all the communications. And then we have an object, which is what's handled by all of the remote clients, and they actually have a handle on the object that describes what the server contains, what, where it's located, and how to communicate with it. Okay. So if we wanted to create a network space outer space, this would do it. Uh, and then we can actually provide additional arguments to that network space, allowing you to change the port for the server, uh, other attributes for the network space uh, that, you, that you may require. Okay. We have a couple basic actions. Um, these actions could, could be uh, storing, fetching, or finding. So with storing, name can be any arbitrary string. It just needs to be something 
uh, that uh, is appropriate that you can understand. Uh, value anything that the host environment is able of serializing. So we can pass data, you can pass functions, you can pass handles to applications as long as the, uh, the host environment is able of serializing that, that object, you can pass it. Um, we can remove that value from the workspace by doing a fetch. This is a blocking operation. Um, we can return the value. This is also a blocking operation using a find. And then we have non-blocking variants of those uh, operations using a try. So you can do a fetch, find, try, and then the name of the value. Uh, and those are non-blocking. And they just return an empty value uh, or some other optional argument if the, uh, the value doesn't exist. As I said, it's implemented in Python via Twisted. It is open source, so you can go off to SourceForge and you can find network spaces on SourceForge. Um, it just uses a general, general internet framework via TCP. This is kind of a problem in that all the, the wire traffic is, uh, is ASCII. It allows us to have no Indian issues, allows us to be able to easily debug the system, but what it doesn't do is provide for security, and that is something that is on our, our radar. Uh, it does make things very simple, so we have a very simple syntax. Uh, it's easy to implement, and because it's simple, we can use any TCP-based TCP -based, uh, or enabled system to be able to communicate. So, as I said, we have MATLAB, R, and Python clients right now. Uh, if there's something else you would like, we could easily add that into network spaces. Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier that you could view the state of variables, so we're using a Babelfish view of our network space. So let's suppose we had some, some values in here. We've got a Python and an R Babelfish, so we've actually got two different clients connecting onto our, our network space, so you're not restricted to just one client connecting onto it. Uh, and then we've got uh, an R place and something we call snake pit. Now if we wanted to look at R place, we can see that there are two values in there. So if I go back one, R place, you can see it says there are two variables in there, and indeed there are two variables in R place. Okay. I can then go and look at the values of uh, one of the variables, LT. There is something called foo with values 1, 2, and 3, and something called bar with values 3, 2, and 1. And you can see down here in the R client, I've actually created those things. And it was a very simple call to do that. I just said at NWS store, network spaces store, I gave it the value of the workspace, WS, and then the value that I wanted to be able to store, where LT up here had been defined as that. So it's very easy to monitor the state of your values. Um, we could also look at more complex things like uh, values of rats and snake pit. So um, we can see other types of, of data. It's a slot uh, variable from Python. Um, so that's just network spaces itself, but how do you access this within R? Uh, we created a package called network spaces client for R. Uh, it uses something called a slay. Uh, this was inspired by the snow package in R written by Luke Tierney, Michael Lee, and uh, Tony Rossini. Snow stands for a simple network of workstations. Um, it's just a, a way of creating a parallel computing environment in R using various transport mechanisms such as MPI, sockets, uh, PVM, and you can actually now create a network spaces client using Snow. But we created something called Slay. It was inspired by Snow. It supports something called a parallel apply, um, as well as other types of parallel uh, functions. Um, apply in, in the R language is, is something like a vector operation. Uh, it's not really a a true vector operation in, in a way, but it's a way of passing in a vector argument and then whatever operation you want to operate on top of that vector has then been pushed down into uh, much lower level code for speed performance so that you're not having to loop over that, that object within the R language. We've actually uh, created parallel versions of that so that whenever you want to use this apply function on say a vector, the process gets distributed out across the, the uh, slay cluster, and then the results aggregated back and pushed back into a single object, much like you would get from a regular apply. Okay. It's uh, implemented on top of network spaces, uh, and it's the primary vehicle that we see statisticians using for accessing the network spaces. And it has very few assumptions. 
Uh, the first is that you have a correctly configured uh, SSH because it can use that to communicate with the different um, uh, R nodes. So we are providing some kind of encryption there, but that's only via the way that we've accessed R. And then we have a utility script that we include uh, with the, uh, uh, the distribution so that you can actually start up this Slay service um, and you don't have, the, the user doesn't have to do that itself. Again, if I had uh, my dongle, you would see that there's a, this would have been a nice animation. You would have typed in uh, this command up here and it would have then started a, an SSH-F-X connection to the different nodes. We could have had each one of these uh, nodes request a task uh, from this, the network spaces object itself and they would have returned the appropriate values. So using Slay, we, uh, we have different ways of performing parallel calculations. We can actually ask each worker to perform uh, some operation, and it may be the, we want to perform the same operation on each one of the workers. We use this each worker, where F is going to be some function that we want to apply, and then the rest of the values that we pass into that function uh, follow after it. Um, and so this is going to actually perform a single function operation on top of an entire data object. If we want something to operate on each element of some object, uh, we then use the each elem function. Uh, this would perform in parallel then uh, whatever F was on each element of V. Uh, we can stop the slay workers. We can also start them back up again using a similar state, uh, start function. And um, we can have many different kinds of arguments. So we can have a mix of decomposed vector and fixed arguments. We can permute. We might be able to permute them to be able to fit the calling conventions of uh, the existing functions that they're calling. And then what it does is it eliminates the need for the user to write uh, wrapper functions uh, around various operations within R. So now they can use this each worker in each elem, pass the function name, and then that function name, uh, that base function name in R is then automatically run in parallel. Um, so why use uh, network spaces? It allows you to have a flow control mode, so it allows statisticians to write code very quickly, very easily. Um, we have a asynchronous non-blocking modes so that you don't have to wait on various uh, applications to finish. Um, we can build up our state uh, using the slay model, so we can actually, with slay, we can actually add nodes into the slay at runtime, so you can actually build up your cluster. Uh, sequentially. Um, it's ideal for embarrassingly parallel prob problems such as bootstrapping, uh, Monte Carlo simulations, uh, Bayesian analysis. Um, and we can mix slay and network spaces to harvest uh, you know, the harder to reach fruit. So we can actually uh, mix in many other types of clients into R and actually run those in parallel. We're not restricted to running only R applications. We can actually uh, run Python and MATLAB applications from our R uh, consoles. Okay. And actually with that, I'm uh, ready for questions. Okay.